In this video, artist Jody Williams demonstrates her techniques for creating botanical watercolor paintings to the members of North Side Art Association. Jody Williams is the Vice President of the American Society of Botanical Artists and a studio artist at the Foundry Arts Center in St. Charles, Missouri. Jody is fascinated by the beauty, variety, and intricacy of the botanical world. The colors, shapes, and patterns of flowers, leaves, and fruit inspire her. Predominantly a self-taught artist, photographer, designer, and gardener, Jody's favorite subjects are the ones that grow around her in nature. Learn more about Jody Williams at www.botanicalbynature.com. And now, artist Jody Williams. What is botanical art? Uh, I, my background is in mechanical engineering. I worked at uh, McDonnell Douglas before it was Boeing when I first got out of college, but I've always had an interest in art. And so many times when I say I, I do botanical art, if people knew me in my background, they immediately ask mechanical art. <laughs> and I say, no, botanical art. So uh, botanical art is um, distinguished from scientific illustration and still lifes and flower painting and uh, uh, landscape painting. It, uh, although all of them may have flowers and plants as subject matter, uh, the definition that the ASBA follows in terms of uh, the art that we teach and support and exhibit consists of art that's um, scientifically and botanically accurate, so it's a real a realism, a realistic art form. And um, so the plant is the predominant uh, subject matter. If there's any other uh, 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 subordinate subject matter in the painting, it should relate in some way to the plant. For example, pollinators, butterflies, bees, other insects, or um, some aspect of a habitat, particularly if it's something that is um, uh, specific to that particular plant. And we try to um, do, make whatever we portray identifiable, at least to the genus level and often to the species level. And when we exhibit our work, we identify uh, the plants with the scientific Latin names just as a, as a convention or a, a tradition. And the tradition of botanical art has quite a long history. I won't go into that tonight, but we actually we have a formal history of botanical art lecture that um, we offer to groups such as yours uh, that we're happy to, to give, but I won't get into that tonight other than to say that it does have a long history and uh, started out as, um, uh, not started, but for gained uh, uh, importance at the time when herbals, uh, plants were, were depicted in art as a means of identifying them uh, so that they could be uh, used for medicinal purposes. And then in the Victorian era, it was uh, very much uh, a wealthy, uh, the wealthy women, that was a pastime, uh, along with embroidery and other uh, kind of fine crafts to be a, a botanical artist. And you often find um, sketchbook, watercolor sketchbooks from that era. I, tr I tend to collect those if I see them on, uh, on Amazon or eBay or in used bookstores or whatever. It's kind of a interesting uh, item to collect. So, um, but other than that, uh, you know, there's some conventions to botanical art. If you notice, looking at most of the samples I brought in, these are all originals um, that I've done. Uh, other than this notebook that has pen and ink on uh, mylar, the rest of these are all watercolor paintings. And you'll notice that they have white backgrounds, uh, very little um, background, and that's just a tradition. They're considered plant portraits. And um, like I said earlier, um, uh, other than the plant material, only uh, pollinators or uh, things that are specific to their habitat would normally be shown. But it is um, distinguished from scientific uh, illustration in its intent. So the intent of it is art. It is intended to evoke emotion. It is intended to be aesthetically pleasing. And 
although some botanical artists choose to depict uh, scientific aspects of the plant, like identifying characteristics or the life cycle of the plant or the reproductive parts of the plant or the um, seasonality changes, those are all strictly up to the artist. So it's the artist's decision, how they portray the plant, how they make it aesthetically <coughs> pleasing, what type of composition they choose, um, as opposed to scientific illustration where the intent is to um, illustrate, to convey some aspect of information, uh, usually um, in terms of defining uh, uh, species for a, uh, a botanist. So in that case, the botanist is dictating or specifying, constraining the illustrator and, and giving the illustrator um, their needs in terms of what needs to be uh, depicted in in the illustration. So we have uh, scientific illustrators in our organization. They do illustrations for botanists that serve a scientific purpose for publication, and they are also beautiful. So um, you know they strive for aesthetically pleasing compositions, and and are often you know as uh, enticing to to look at as the non uh, scientific illustrations, but there is a different intent. And one of the things that I think is, um, you know, really illustrates that is when you start to look at a, a single, a single plant or a single uh, even specimen, and see the great variety in treatment that two different artists uh, might use. And so I'm going to just. Um, these, what, I, what I brought along with me are a number of catalogs from exhibitions that the American Society of Botanical Artists curates. We curate an uh, international juried exhibition uh, each September that's held in Manhattan. And this, is, this year is the 17th annual exhibition. And so this has artwork from um, our members from all over the world. There's 40 pieces that are selected for this exhibition each year from a field of usually about 200, 200 entries. So if, um, I really think that's kind of the, I'll get into demonstrating the painting techniques, but um, I think it's helpful ahead of time to have a little bit of a sense of the genre. Uh, I find that um, people don't have a great deal of familiarity with it, so if you want to flip through, you will notice some of the, the identifying characteristics of the, Here's a scientific illustration. Here's uh, one with with the with the uh, white or you know no background. But also, as you page through, you'll find that you know the artists do break the rules and they do um, uh, make their own artistic choices and um, sometimes do depict um, uh, more than just a, a plant on a white on a white background. That catalogs from the Hunt Institute for Botanical Documentation at Carnegie Mellon University. They have the largest uh, collection of botanical art in the United States, really in North America. And every three years, they hold an international exhibition that includes only artists that you can only be in that exhibition one time in your life. So they're they're out combing the world looking for um, contemporary botanical artists that they can document and that they can include a piece in this collection um, and, and maintain it as a historical record of the state of contemporary botanical art in the world today. Um, this one I'll also pass around. This is an exhibition that's on right now at the New York Botanical Garden. And every three years, the American Society of Botanical Artists joins with um, NYBG to do a themed exhibition. And we really strive to uh, show how artists depicting plants can both bring the audience closer to the plant world and have an appreciation for and a sensitivity uh, to the plants, but also how when artists um, take the time that it takes to do some of these intricate, um, realistic plant portraits, what a connection the artist um, gains. So. In these themed exhibitions, we did the first one was um, on economic botany, so they were all plants of economic significance. Uh, this one is called Weird, Wild, and Wonderful, so it's plant uh, oddities in the plant world. And as you can see, this is you know an heirloom tomato, so you know not your uh, 
your typical uh, grocery store variety. And um, this just has uh, just some really amazing, uh, you know, carnivorous plants and plants that glow in the dark, plants that uh, do all kinds of just, you know, things that uh, you don't find in the Lowe's uh, Garden Center. So I, I guess to distinguish it again from like still life, um, uh, usually the plant subject is depicted as it would be found in nature and not arranged with inanimate objects. And then there's also kind of conventions in terms of um, lighting and we don't usually show a table or a surface or cast shadows onto a surface. And we usually, um, the convention is to light the subject um, from the from the left at about 11 o'clock over the, the shoulder. And that's for a number of reasons. Um, one, it, it is the lighting that reveals three-dimensional form the best. And I think you, you know people that study art and history of art would find that in a number of other genres. That um, if you have backlit subject, you have, especially in plants where many of them are translucent and some of the light can show through, you start seeing all the the different layers and that can be confusing in terms of just you know portraying the, the form of the plant if you have uh, and, it, and if the subject's not translucent you're not going to get any you know definition of, of color or form or detail on the front so we tend to light from the left for right-handed artists many times we have a lot of left-handed artists and that's a whole other subject I'm kind of interested in why we have so many left-handed artists um, Seems disproportionate to me. I think there might be something to that. Um, but the left hand art, left-handed artists will light from the right side, and that's so that they're not you're not blocking the light as you work. So that's why it changes. And another reason for the consistent light source is because this is a realistic art form, and um, there's quite a bit of similarities and crossover between botanical art and scientific illustration. Um, when botanical art is done to identify plants and depict plants, they'll have a lot of artists contributing to the same publication and by having, you know, kind of standardized lighting conventions, there's more consistency in the look of the artwork from different artists and, and uh, the same publication. But we follow the same basic progression um, in botanical art regardless of the subject and regardless of the complexity of the piece. I certainly did not bring anything very complex tonight um, to demonstrate. I've got a, a little baby eggplant and some little grapes and we were working on these in, uh, in Denver at the conference and so I had some materials ready that I could show you. And the reason I have two different subjects is um, they're, they're both basically, you know, oblong spheres, but the eggplant is quite... Um, you know, heavy and it's got a lot of bulk to it. It's very, very dark and um, and reflective, whereas the grapes are um, much more translucent and have a lighter kind of look and feel to them. And so we approach, we would approach those two subjects differently because of the the bulk and volume of one and the and the uh, translucency of the other. So I'll kind of talk about the the differences. Um, so the steps that we that we usually follow are first to really observe the subject. And there are some artists that go as far as, you know, closing their eyes and feeling it, smelling it, uh, you know, really studying it from, from all angles. Um, I probably don't go to as great of extent in terms of that as others do, but because it is a realistic art form, we do attempt to get... Um, you know, proportions, uh, accurate. And another convention I don't follow myself personally, but it is a typical convention, is to do one-to-one -one scale. So doing a, a painting that would end up with a, an eggplant on the page that's the same size as the eggplant that's in the subject. Um, I don't do that, just um, it's not something that is... Um, I, I don't get hung up on it. <laughs> For example, this is a, a bird foot violet, much smaller. I mean, the, the size of the flower is about like this. 
um, so this is much larger. Um, so I, I tend to do most things larger, and I tend to do things, I, I tend to really, really focus on composition and a kind of a more graphic, um, stylized, contemporary composition, whereas the very traditional botanical art would show the entire plant. Um, and I just find that that's one reason why I think some people walk by botanical art is because in the quest to represent the whole plant and re represent the plant full size, you end up with a lot of white paper and a little bit of, of plant. Well, there's a lot of you know, tall, spindly plants, and I just feel that people tend to walk by because they don't capture the interest. And if you really focus in on a particular aspect of the plant, uh, so that it's, you know, filling more of the composition that, to me, it seems more compelling. So, um, these are all part of a series. Um, again, this is another one. These are, uh, these are bluets. They're about this big. <laughs> so, really tiny. And, and I get excited about, you know, things that, you know, my, my husband or my son would walk through the woods and just trample over or walk past or the dog would run by. Um, if I notice it and can capture the beauty of it in something like this, then it helps to draw attention to, to things that people you know, might not otherwise notice. There's a lot of flowers out in, the, out in the woods and around the ponds that are almost microscopic, but they're beautiful if you get down there and look at them. Absolutely. Like the, the bluets really have this, you know, really... Um, uh, you know, bright pink centers with the green, and um, you know, you wouldn't notice it since the, the flower itself is only about this big, and it's predominantly a really bright, beautiful blue. You might notice the blue, especially because they grow in these clusters. But when you really take a close, uh, close look at it, you start to see um, more and more detail. And that's really, um, I think, what when people start to do botanical art, at first they might, they might feel that. They might think that it's too detailed or it takes too much discipline and they, just, they want results faster or they want to work faster, but it really becomes a very contemplative, relaxing kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, you're able to go into that right side of your brain and, and once you, you know, really focus on a plant long enough to do uh, a piece of artwork, particularly to the level of detail that you see in those catalogs, People really, you know, they love that plant by the time they're, they're done with it. So, um, let's see. So, the first step is observation. And, um, and then the second step is to do a, a basic contour um, or line drawing. Um, so, I'll just kind of hold this up. This one's a little bit darker. But I just, I take any kind of um, drawing paper. I'm not terribly particular. This happens to be what's on, been on my table lately. And I'll just sit down. I, may, I do make sure that I'm, you know, aligned with the subject and I have good posture that I'm going to keep the whole time so that doesn't change because if I, you know, if I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing this, then of course the, the perspective and the angle is going to change. And so I do um, make an attempt to, to keep that stable. And, you know, just a very, very simple um, line drawing and in pencil. And I'll use whatever's comfortable, like just a, you know, probably a 2H or a H pencil. Something fairly soft that gives me a nice feel as I'm drawing. And um, sometimes I get a little sketchy, but for the most part, I'm fairly intent on just, you know, putting pencil in the paper, making a, a confident... Uh, line and attempting to um, depict the subject. For something like an eggplant, it's fairly easy. I will, um, I will often start with a pair of dividers and I'll just um, do a very basic, you know, top to bottom or the, the main portion of it and the, um, and the width in order to just kind of give me a bounding box to start with. Um, and, uh, and if it's a more complicated subject, I'll even... Um, use a picture plane so that I'm not, um, you know, tilting, you know, doing measurements like this, which would have absolutely no uh, use because what I'm trying to capture here is, is the perspective. So sometimes I will mount 
actually mount a picture plane so I know that when I'm holding my dividers up, I'm always holding them at the same, um, at the same uh, distance from the subject. If, if the subject is um, very, very small, this, this is about the angle that I like to have the subject, so I'm looking slightly down. Um, I don't like to have it straight up, and I certainly wouldn't have it above eye level. But so basically, if I drew a line from, you know, from my nose to the to the uh, to the subject, that picture plane would be tilted slightly so that it was perpen you know perpendicular to that uh, to that line of sight. Okay. And I don't I don't trace or draw the subject on here. I just use that so that when I hold the the dividers and make some you know basic uh, measurements that I'm not. You know, I'm, and I'm not tilting it or I'm not holding it a different distance. So it's kind of like the pencil with your, with your thumb for, for plein air uh, painters. Same concept. Okay. So after I, do a, uh, after I do a simple line drawing, I'll then take um, just regular uh, tracing paper, nothing fancy. Again, this is just happens to have to be what I have at the moment, but I, I'll use any kind of tracing paper. And I'll um, make a tracing of, uh, of that line drawing. And then I'll use the tracing to, um, I'll often do a, uh, a tonal, uh, tonal study. And often I'll do that tonal study on the tracing paper. And sometimes I'll even do it um, without doing the outline on the tracing paper, I'll just set it over the outline and then do the tonal study so that I don't have any, any edges. And I don't, I, I use the tonal study to some extent for reference, but it's more just, once again, internalizing the observation of the subject. So if I can, if I can uh, you know, spend the time to really observe the subject and, and create that tonal study, then when I am, am, am painting, I've already kind of internalized it form and the shadows and the reflected light. When you're doing a tonal study like that and you've got that on a, a white handkerchief, how do you handle the reflection? Um, I, will, I will put some of that reflection in and I will choose um, what I put underneath that so that I get the level of reflected light that I want to try to depict in the painting. And I'll usually use, um, sometimes Sometimes I'll use a different color or I'll use black if I don't want to have a lot of reflected if light. Have, if you just have that, uh, uh, whatever that is. The little box plant, under there? If you've oh, got right. that there and it's, and it's on white paper with nothing around it, you've got a reflection of something. Yeah, and, and I guess that's one of the peculiarities of this genre <laughs> is that we use that as a means of, um, of uh, showing form, even though we're not showing what it is that's, you know, like creating that reflected light. And that may feel funny to a lot of you that are used to doing still lifes where, you know, you can see what it is that's creating that reflected light. And we'll tend to do things that... Um, like for, we do a lot of fruits and vegetables out of the grocery store because they're, you know, they're easy to get, they sit still, they don't, you know, wilt, they don't desiccate, you know, it's just, it's, especially for beginning assignments, it takes the frustration, you know, out of tulips that are opening <laughs> minute by minute and are never the same flower, you know, each time you sit down to paint them, but, um, uh, you know, so we'll, We'll just make those, um, sometimes we'll, we'll try to use whatever we set it on to, to be consistent with what it would be in in nature. So sometimes people will put, you know, a green cloth, you know, to provide some green reflected light or they'll have blue for, for sky or whatever so that it helps them see it as it more closely to what it would be like in its natural setting. Do you, do you always put it on a post or something, or do, do you ever just take a photograph of it, like the, the tulip that's blossoming too quickly? To, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I definitely use photographs for reference and to maintain a record of what 
stuff. I love to paint mushrooms. That's one of my favorite. And 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 that's not even you know technically it's not a you know it's not a plant. It has you know scientifically it's closer to an animal than to a plant. But it it has maintained its you know status in the botanical art world that it's accept you know people, lots of people paint mushrooms and it gets in, you know it's an acceptable subject matter for botanical art even though it's not uh, uh, scientifically a plant. And, you know, those don't last, <laughs> a lot of them, some of them do, um, but a lot of them just don't last very long. So, yeah, I do, but when I take my reference photos, I'll take them, I'll set everything up the way I, I sketch and I start to draw, and I'll take those reference photographs, you know, from the same angle and with, the, with it lit the way it is so that I can refer back to that if, if my subject is, is no, longer, no longer available. Some people, you know, go pick, you know, more of the same plant, you know, and start substituting in, you know, different yeah. specimens as there's, I've never, some of the paintings that are in those catalogs that I pass around, I mean, artists spend several months on one painting to the, le to the level of detail that's in there. I don't currently have the patience to do that, and I don't, I don't have the skill yet to do that. I'd like to get to that point, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I, I finish things in a week at the most, you know, a day at the least and a week at the most. And um, so, anyway, but another thing is I will use, um, if, if I wasn't, um, you know, if, if you all weren't trying to see what I was doing, <laughs> I would normally, you know, put a, a plain background, either white or black, usually behind the subject again, just to, it, it does add some additional you know, reflections, but most of them are on, you know, uh, uh, but it mostly just relieves me of the distraction of what's what's behind the subject. And then um, the other thing is I tend, I tend to, to and, and I wouldn't have all these, I mean, right now I've got, you know, reflections from every single one of these um, fluorescent lights, so when I'm in my studio, I'm much more controlled, and I actually have a different plug-in light that I would use in my studio. Um, but these are daylight um, lights, and, um, uh, you know, it just adds to that consistency. But m most botanical artists kind of just, regardless of the lighting, they, they follow, I don't know that I agree with this, but it's very, very prominent that, you know, any spherical... Any spherical subject, you know, they're they're going to divide it like this, put a highlight here, and then you know, kind of do a, a, a shadow in here, reflected light in here. So this is going to be, you know, the darkest part of their subject. This is going to be a little lighter. This is going to be a little lighter, and this is going to be a highlight. And they'll do that even if that's not what they're seeing. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just a convention in that art form, and it you know they. They expect to see grapes that look like this and apples that look like this and, you know, anything that's shiny with a highlight. This is kind of the, the formula. I, I tend to like to look at my subject. You know, I'd rather, you know, look at it and go based on, on what, I, what I'm observing. Um, so after I, get, after I do the tonal study and I, and I have the outline and I trace it on tracing paper and then I transferred to my watercolor paper, and I use any one of a number of different methods. Um, I paint on one of two different papers, um, either 140-pound hot press arches, um, usually from a block, um, or 300-pound Fabriano Artistico. And um, the, uh, I don't know if how familiar are. this this would be the 140 pound arches hot press and so you know if if you all are watercolor painters I mean a lot of people that if you're not doing botanical art um, I, I was most familiar with painting on cold press or even rough um, paper so hot press paper was a new thing to me when I started doing botanical art you know it is very smooth but then it allows um, you to get the fine detail and to have the control and it's not adding textures where there's not um, texture in the plants um, and we tend to paint very dry compared to traditional watercolor so 
We don't um, soak the paper. We don't stretch the paper. Um, we don't. Um, some people use a you know a masonite drawing board, and they might tilt uh, somewhat to do a flat wash if they have a large a large area. I tend to work almost flat most of the time. Hmm. And um, and then if I use the, this is a the three hundred pound um, art, uh, Fabriano Artistico. It's got some exercises on the back from a, a class. Um, and so this is almost, you know, like cardstock, and it's really heavy. Um, and, you know, you, you can tell this isn't buckled at all. Um, I'm just not using that much water on that yeah. large of an area. So um, very rarely will you um, see a botanical artist uh, stretching, stretching watercolor paper, which I kind of like. I always thought that was, you know, half the battle was trying to, <laughs> to deal with, with uh, stretching the paper. So... Um, once, um, so once I have that um, tracing, then what I'll transfer to the watercolor paper either, if I'm using the 140 pound, which is thinner, um, I'll use a, I can use a light box um, or uh, a window. I have a big patio window. I do a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, transferring by just putting my, uh, putting my line drawing behind my watercolor paper on the patio window and trace the line drawing. Um, if I'm using 300 pound paper or it's a cloudy day or it's at night or I don't have my light box, then I'll um, uh, transfer using transfer paper. And I don't use commercial carbon paper. I just find that it leaves too dark of a, of a line and, or else I just have too heavy of a, of a pressure and it's difficult for me to lift the line up. And so I use this little guy here, which I've had for many, many years, and um, it's just a piece of the same tracing paper. Took a, a soft pencil, a B or a, probably a B pencil, and just uh, covered this sheet in all different directions. Took a Kleenex and, and burnished it. You can even put a little bit of alcohol on a cotton cotton swab and burnish it. And that'll really kind of keep the, the dust um, from coming off of it. And then you can use, there's, they, they have kind of contests when I go to this conference and everybody who has the oldest piece of transfer, <laughs> transfer paper because they really keep them for their whole lives and they continue to work. And um, another thing is, it's the, you know, this is as big as I want. I don't want a full sheet because I don't want it to transfer just from resting my hand or um, inadvertently smudging if I'm shifting around. So instead, I'll shift this around underneath, um, underneath uh, my drawing. If I don't use this, um, I might also just uh, um, flip flip my line drawing over, trace on the back again with like a soft uh, B or HB pencil, and then put it down on the watercolor paper. And when I Go to actually transfer the um, transfer the image on. Then I'll use a harder pencil, probably like a 4H, um, really sharp, but with a light touch. And then that gives me a, a fine line. I'm still going to have the the soft lead on the back or on the transfer paper that's going to come off onto the um, onto the watercolor paper. But at least it'll be a very fine line that I can achieve with the harder pencil on the top surface. There's something. Do you keep a hair dryer by you to, to dry it as you go? Or? No, I usually keep multiple things going at the same time. So like, th I mean, this was, a, this was a class exercise, but that's why there's four of them. So, you know, we would, do, we would practice on one and the next and the next and the next, and by the time we got done with that, this one was probably, you know, okay to go back to. And again, we're not using tons and tons of water. And right. I was doing this in Denver, so it was really almost like really hard to get enough water. You know, it was just evaporated. So I'm, you know, having to adjust to being back in St. Louis, although it's not too bad right now. So, um, so I'll take a like a 4H, and I'll go over my tracing. And one thing that was, if anybody's interested in graphite drawing 
um, particularly of natural history subjects, whether it's animals or plants. There's an artist, one of our members, her name is Katie Lee, and she, she teaches at the New York Botanical Garden. And she has a phenomenal book out called um, uh, Graphite, I think it's just called Graphite Drawing. And it's like a spiral bound, and it has exercises in it. And it really goes through some techniques that I had never, ever um, been exposed to before. And one of them was this idea of drawing, drawing toward me. You know, like I had always, I think it's like the Watson Guptal, you know, those old, those old books that have been around forever, um, you know, pen and ink drawing and, and graphite drawing, and there's a watercolor book too um, by Guptal, not just the publisher, but it was the, he was the author. And they're always talking about like you when you write, if you're right-handed and you and you're American or you know English and you write from left to right, you're used to this motion from left to right. And so I always thought I should be drawing from left to right. And he that's what that said in that book. And she was teaching the opposite. And I took a class and it was extremely awkward. Whenever I take a class, I try to do everything during the class the way the instructor teaches it, even if it's completely opposite to what I do, just because I feel like, why else would I come and you know take a class with somebody unless I'm willing to, to try what they're, what they're sharing? And so, you know, she, she's always saying um, to draw towards you because then you can see. You know, if I'm right-handed and I'm drawing this way, I'm blocking, you know, the direction that I'm heading. And if I'm coming this way, then I'm seeing what I'm about to, to draw. And the other thing that I had never thought of was instead of watching my pencil point as I'm tracing that line, I look ahead a half inch, an inch. And so I'm looking at where I'm, where I'm aiming, not where I already am. So it's kind of like driving looking in the rearview mirror <laughs> instead of out the windshield. So those are a couple things that, you know, were new to me that have really been helpful. And when I, when I do this um, transferring, so then when I get to here, I can't, it's very awkward to keep going this way, so then I just turn the paper and go the other way. And so we do a lot of turning the paper so that we're, and that's another reason why it's kind of handy not to have this on a big drawing board and not working on a on an incline is because we do a lot of this. And another thing that was completely counterintuitive that I've just started doing um, after a class is having my water and my paints and my brushes and my little wipe off thing and my little test strip on the left. I'm right-handed, and I always had it all over here. It just seemed like, you know, you just, I don't know, I just assumed I should have it all over here. And then this instructor, everybody thought she was left-handed until she sat down, and all her stuff was over here, and in fact, she, would, she wouldn't allow any of this. You know, it would, this would all be clear. And then that allows her, when she's painting with her right hand, to not be, you know, dodging, dodging her stuff. And it really, the motion is more fluid with a brush going here, 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 than going here and back. You know, even if these things were closer. And I never thought of that. I mean, so I've just made that change very, very recently and found that I really, I really like the idea of not having a cluttered space and having everything on the left. I don't, is that unusual to people? Does that sound unusual? That sounds smart. Pardon? It sounds smart. Yeah, that's what I thought. You know, but it never, little things like that just never dawn on you. The other thing is, um, you know, this is the palette that I, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about um, the materials that I use. I go to these classes and, you know, every time you take a class, they give you the list of materials and it's really long and it's really expensive and you don't have any of it. <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, the class costs this much, and then I gotta go out and buy all this stuff, you know. And then you get there, and then they don't use it. <laughs> yeah, have you done that? So, so I, you know, I went through the typical color exploration that most watercolorists do in their classes, you know. And so, 
I I had the Will, are you familiar with the Wilcox books? Um, I don't know, maybe there's um, uh, an author's last name is Wilcox. He did like Blue and Yellow Don't Make Green uh, was one of the books that he has. And then he has one that's all just on pigments, on, um, on paints and pigments. And so the first thing I learned was to completely ignore, you know, the brand, the, the name that the manufacturer gives to the paint. So if it says ultramarine blue, I ignore that, okay? And I look at the pigment designation, which is an ASTM for those of us that were engineers and materials people at McDonnell Douglas. <laughs> you know, you see ASTM and American Standards and Testing you know, Materials, is that close? Um, so there's... You know, the chemical pigment name and the chemical pigment designation. So they're pigment PY, pigment yellow, and a number. PR, pigment red, and a number. Kind of like PMS color. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pantone, and yeah, so it's a, it's a standard, and it's the chemical pigment. And so what I did was I, I, I looked at all the pigments that were transparent or semi transparent and permanent, okay? So I don't want fugitive colors, I don't want organic dyes, I want pigments that'll last. And I don't want combinations of pigments because, you know, if there's, um, what do I have in here? I think I have like 72 single pigment paints or something like that. Um, so if you start combining those and you figure out how many different combinations of those, it's endless, okay? So I, this was just the, the assortment of single pigment, transparent, permanent um, pigments that I wanted to use to test in order to determine for myself personally what palette do I want to have. Okay, instead of a teacher telling me what palette to bring in or what colors or paints to bring in, I, I want to decide that and I want to know why and understand why I use the ones that I use. And so I did, you know, as a good mechanical engineer <laughs> would do, <laughs> I did, you know, kind of the exhaustive um, color charts. And, and th these color charts are really only reds, yellows, and blues. Okay, I didn't, I, I did, initially I did just tint charts of, of all of the pigments just to get familiar with the... Um, uh, the handling of them and the and the color of them, but then to choose what I wanted, I did. I just did yellow and red, looking at oranges, yellow and blue, looking at greens, and blue and reds, looking at purples. And I was looking for the clearest, non-muddy, most vibrant combinations of hues. And I was trying to decide. I like to have. I like to use a three-color palette. I had always used just red, yellow, and blue. Mixed all my colors. I don't use Payne's gray. I don't use burnt sienna, I don't use burnt umber, you know, I, I mix all my neutrals, I use red, yellow, and blue, but I used to select which red, which yellow, and which blue based on the subject, and looking at these charts, which one came closest to the particular subject that I was working on. And then I was introduced to the concept of a six color palette, which is uh, the Wilcox um, green and yellow don't make blue, um, where you you choose a warm and cool of each of the primaries. So you have a, an orange bias red and a violet bias red, and you have a, a green bias yellow and an orange bias yellow, and the same for the blues. And so um, after, doing, after doing these series of color charts, I convinced myself that I needed a six color palette instead of a three color palette. And so this is, I think I invented this little arrangement. I've never seen this arranged anywhere. When I went to a six color palette, I was really confused about when, you know, when I start to neutralize a color with its complement, which complement do I use? Um, if I'm not using a pure yellow, I'm using warm and cool yellows. And so um, what this chart, my, what my color chart represents are the six colors that I ended up selecting. And these are the only six colors I use now, for the most part, for any subject that I start. And um, the outside represents, like, pure hues. So this is, 
Um, has anybody heard of like color systems like RGB and um, uh, CMYK for printing and RGB is like red, yellow, uh, red, blue, green um, in the computer. And HSL st stands for hue, saturation, and lightness. And, and I find hue, saturation, and lightness much more like intuitive to me at least. And so the hue is just where on the on the color wheel is it? The uh, red, yellow, you know, oh. red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. So those are the <coughs> hues. And I have my pure hues out here. And then um, and then the uh, uh, so what I do is I take the um, you know the the violet bias red and the violet bias blue. And when I mix those, I get the purest, the purest, most vibrant, glowing colors. And then the same thing when I use the, the green bias blue and the green bias yellow, I get the purest, the purest greens. And so, um, and then I can, I can start, when I start using ones that don't match, then I start getting these kind of duller colors as I get, get closer into the center because I'm including more and more of the complementary colors. And um, so that's kind of how I uh, settled on the palette that I have. So, um, so this is what I, so, so, you know, although I, this is what I experimented with and explored, this is what I use. Okay. And, um, and these are, um, these are empty half pans that um, I buy by the bag full um, from, this place called Kremer Pigments in Manhattan, and they're on the internet, and you can buy a bag of 25 for three dollars or something. And um, and then you can buy these. You know, this is a whole, you know, a watercolor with space for um, you know mixing and, and palette as is this one. But then you know, I have friends that you know they go to Walgreens and they get the. Uh, the pill boxes, you know, with the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and use those, or they get secrets boxes and put these in. But and, and so this is all tube paint. So rather than you know spending the first half an hour of every painting session squirting tube, you know, paint out on my palette, or um, I just squeeze these into 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 here and leave this at home. And what brand do you use? Um, that was part of when I when I tested them and selected, I ended up with a kind of a mix. Oh, okay. So I have, um, you know, predominantly Windsor Newton, but I also have, um, let's see, I'll tell you the six. Um, so I have I have a Da Vinci Hansa Yellow Light, which is PY3. I have a Windsor Newton is Yellow Deep, Windsor Yellow Deep, which is PY65. Uh, Windsor Newton Scarlet Lake, um, which is a PR188. And Windsor Newton Permanent Rose, um, which is a qu quinacridone, which is like a new pigments that are really popular. And then uh, Da Vinci Ultramarine Blue and Da Vinci Phthalo Blue. So it is a, it's a mix of brands yeah. just based on what what seemed to make the, the most vibrant uh, good. color combinations. So I, um, I uh, had my tracing transferred to my uh, watercolor paper. And then I want the, it's pretty rough when I get done with uh, that first tracing. So then I'll take this off and still using the number four fairly hard sharp pencil, I'll go back over that line just one time, very, very lightly, and I try to just nail the nail the line the very first time. Drawing toward me. And then that gives a hard uh, definitive line and I only do the edges I, I, I don't 
I don't, I only do the physical edges of the object. I don't do any patterns. I don't do any, you know, it's only the, the edges um, that are on here. And then I take a, a kneaded eraser, which is my favorite, you know, it's, when it's not an eraser, it's a stress reliever. <laughs> and I need one of those. And um, I, either, I either dab it, and the dabbing is not picking up the 4-H that I just drew so much. It's picking up the B, the soft B that was on the, on the back of here or that was on my transfer paper. And I try to make it as light as I possibly can and still see it. And I either dab or I'll pinch off a little bit and <clears throat> make a little rolling pin and just roll it around the edge. Try to lift up as much of that as I could possibly see, or possibly um, take off and still see. I'm going to leave it a little bit darker so that if you guys um, happen to look, or just for the sake of time, because I I like to erase all much as almost as much as I like to draw. <laughs> it's really, really, if you could, I, I guess I need to do one of those like negative art forms where you start with like you know. I guess it's like when you were in grade school and you covered the crayon with all the black and then you scratched it with the paper clip. But, um, yeah, I really like erasing. So, um, so then I end up with a very, very faint uh, line drawing. And then, so the next step will be to put on initial washes. And so, you know, these... Um, These right here probably have about six or seven washes on them right now. And um, the key to multiple washes is let it dry, let it dry. I mean, really let it dry. You know, if you go back in there when it's still wet, it just, you know, uh, it's a mess. Eggplants are great beginner subjects. They're very forgiving. The colors are forgiving. Um, uh, we do a lot of eggplants. Um, do your block? Yeah, we do a lot of different, a uh, lot of different approaches. Um, there's, um, we're trying to get the the three dimensional form, and this one you can kind of see like what I drew up there. So I'm trying to get a highlight, a deep area, and a little bit of reflected light to start to give that some form. And the earlier, I like to get the form in as early as I can because it just makes me feel like I can feel the subject. Some artists will do like a completely flat color, you know, all, they'll get all the colors in, and then at the very end they'll start doing the, sh the shading and the shadows and trying to establish the form. And I find it very confusing to leave the form till the end of the painting. I like to try to establish that sense of three-dimensionality as early as I can. Once it dries, the pigment's there, and then you're just depositing another layer of pigment and another layer of pigment and another layer of pigment. But, but it's, it's real dry between, mm -hmm. in between one. Absolutely dry in between. And, and you do have to have a light touch, and you do have to know your paints, because some paints will move around a little bit more than others. And, um, and if you have really good paper, they'll move around more, you know, like, which you can use to your advantage, too. But um, you, you get a feel for, you know, how much water you can use and how light of a touch it takes to not disturb the layers that are underneath. I'll just do um, one wash, and then, um, and then we'll call it a night. Um, but I do start out with wet, with, with wet washes, and then after I get, probably when I get it about to this point, then I would start going in and doing dry brush um, you know, to perfect the edges and to add the, the stems and, and things like that. But I'll just, sh you know, share my wash technique um, with you and then we'll wrap up. So I bring water to the center, so I'm going to, of the, so I'm just, I'm just dropping water in. And I'm looking at the reflection of the water and the light. And, I mean, this instructor that I had this week, she spent more time, time than I've ever seen anybody spend with water, you know, before she ever, um, before she ever put any pigment on. 
So that's this is pretty good right now. I can look at it. And and the other thing is I don't lift my brush up a lot. I keep it, I swirl it, and that way I'm it's back to physics. I'm trying to keep the brush and the paper at about the same um, moisture content. So that's that looks pretty good. I'm turning, going. And I always keep the brush on the inside of the shape so that we use this is a sable hair, um, a Kalinsky sable brush, and I pick one that has a really, really sharp point. I don't care quite so much how big the brush is as long as it has a really, really um, nice point to it. And then I really should have um, put a little... I use an eyedropper. It's really handy for reconstituting um, paint, both in these boxes as well as in a palette. I like to use this daisy round palette because if you have a square palette, you're scrunching your brushes up, you know, like trying to go around inside a square palette. So if I'm in a in a round palette, it's nice and in porcelain, um, preferably nice and and smooth on my. And then I'll drop paint in to the areas that I know are going to be the darkest. shouldn't have put quite so much water in here. And I usually would test over here, you know, and see if I'm pleased with the... And I, I don't want to go all the way to the edge because what happens is, um, is uh, the paint's gonna the paint's gonna bleed out, right? And so if I paint on the edge, that doesn't have anywhere to go, but the other's gonna, you know, bleed out toward it, and then you end up with that hard line, that fortress of pigment out on the edge. So I don't paint all the way up to the edge. It looks like I said, this is a little bit. Um, I don't have as much pigment in in the in the brush as I would have liked. And then I just kind of watch it and monitor it, and. Um, I might dry my brush off a little bit and do kind of a kind of a swipe along the edge to smooth that out. And I just kind of watch it as it's drying, and um, so that as it's starting to dry, if it didn't get all the way out to that edges out to that edge on its own, I can kind of help it along. Did you wet the brush before you did that? I missed. I yeah, I, w I was just in this pool of pigment here, okay. and um, and so that is all I would do right now. I would just stop and let it dry, let it completely dry. Focused in North St. Louis County, Northside Art Association is a nonprofit 501c3 arts organization that serves local artists through community exposure, networking, education, and peer interaction. Learn more about Northside Art Association at www.northsideartassociation.org.